Hi, Anthony. Hi, Bob. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Good. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available, as I never tire of saying, on both streaming video and via audio podcast. You are Kwame Anthony Appia, very well-known philosopher. You probably need no introduction for most of our viewers and listeners. Um, you've also written a number of books, both both uh, academic and more uh, accessible, I guess. Uh, probably best known for cosmopolitanism, would you say? Probably, and probably, also yes. the honor code. Um, you also, by the way, write the, uh, the ethicist uh, column for the New York Times Magazine. I do, yes. So if I need any guidance in the course of this conversation, <laughs> I'm talking to exactly the, the right person. Y you are. I actually need a lot of <laughs> <laughs> um, we all do. We, <laughs> some of us more than others. Um, so anyway, you are just now, as this is posted, uh, this conversation, you are uh, publishing this new book, The Lies That Bind, Rethinking Identity. Looks like this. Congratulations. Thanks very much. Great book. Beautifully written. You. you really are a lovely writer. In fact, you write Thank novels. You. So I should have mentioned that. Um, <laughs> And in addition to being, you know, a, a, a work of philosophy in some sense, it also has kind of the flavor of a, I don't know, of an anthropological uh, journey. You know, I, I mean, there's just a lot of really interesting uh, kind of local color, you might say, along various dimensions. Uh, so, it's, so it's a lot of fun. Um, so, and, and it speaks to issues that have gotten a whole lot of attention lately. Um, it is, as the subtitle suggests, it is uh, an interrogation, as they say these days, of the concept of identity. Um, but, but there are, uh, you know, you're hearing, um, a lot about the subject these days. I mean, three terms that you're hearing a lot about are identity politics, generally thought of as residing on the left, I guess, um, ethno-nationalism, generally thought of as residing on the right, uh, tribalism, thought of as encompassing all of these, th these things and more. For starters, uh, is it fair to say that you're not a huge fan of any of these? Uh, I, I, I know for sure you're not a huge fan of some, but, but uh, you know, identity politics, ethno-nationalism, tribalism, do you, is the book um, kind of, uh, it entails a certain skepticism about all three, is that fair to say? Yes, I mean, I think uh, it, because it entails skepticism about identity, not because I think we can do without it, but because it can do terrible harm as well as some good. And I think the real challenge is to get, get the balance as far over towards the side of doing good as possible. Um, identity politics is an expression I think was invented by people who didn't like it. So it's, it's one of those terms that by definition, it's hard to say you could be in favor of if you use the expression it means you're against it. But, um, I, and I, I suppose, I worry that the, the, the expression itself um, suggests something that I just denied, which is that um, identity is what's bad in itself, as opposed to something that can be put to bad uses. So when people talk about identity politics, it's as if you could do politics without identity, and that what's bad is doing politics with identity. But I think what's bad is doing politics with identity, either the wrong identities or in the wrong ways. <laughs> and um, because otherwise, look, a nationalism, ethno-nationalism, or even civic nationalism of the sort that one might be inclined to favor in the United States, a kind of constitutional nationalism that says, look, we're all in this together, we need to care about our country and its traditions and its welfare. Um, th that's a kind of identity politics. And if it's done right, nothing wrong with it. It's, it can lead people to say, well, look, I don't know you, but you're a fellow American, Ghanaian, Frenchman, and because of that, I'm willing to put myself out a little bit for you. I'm willing to do something for you. So ethno-nationalism can be the basis of forms of solidarity that can generate, you know, the, the many of the good things in modern politics, uh, uh, resilient social welfare systems, and so on. So I, I, But it is also true that with the people who use the expression identity politics in a negative way have a point. Mm -hmm. There are lots of contexts in which appeals to identity are, first of all, mobilized not for solidarity, but in, uh, not to bring us together, but to push them away and to be hostile to them. And in general, hatred is a vice. Uh, so, uh, so, that's, so I think there's a, there's a real criticism 
There's a correct criticism of identity politics, but I don't know that the word identity or the expression identity politics is the best way of making it because, as I say, it implies that you could do politics without identity. There's 330 odd million Americans. We can only do things together by way of some identity or other. Mm -hmm. And that's what identities are good for. Okay. So before we get into the argument of the book, um, I want to do a couple more things. One is I want to talk a little about your book, Cosmopolitanism, because I think this is best seen in the context of, of the set of concerns that you laid out there. But, but also you, I think, use the word Ghanaian, uh, which reminds me that maybe we should talk about your, your own identity, as it were, because you have uh, an unusual one, I guess it's fair to say. Um, what would you say by way of um, introducing yourself along that dimension? Well, in terms of the identities people care about, I'm um, a gay American of anglo ghana <laughs> ancestry with an Anglican background. Okay. Uh, and... Uh, um, yeah. And I'm a man, but that's not worth saying because it's too obvious. Well, and actually, I mean, interestingly, you did not. You, you, you talk about in the book, you get into five uh, things, you, you, categories or dimensions of identity. And you, you, you kind of go through them and talk about them. You manage to make them all start with C, which impresses me. Uh, <laughs> creed, meaning religion, country, color, class. Um, and culture, you don't, you don't get into, you don't, you don't at least address as its own category, either gender or sexual orientation. Um, that, and yet those are very prominent in identity discussions today. Is there a reason you didn't, you didn't, uh, well, I hope that there, I mean, there is a discussion in the first chapter, which has, says a fair amount about sex and gender and sexuality. And I took those to be model. Identities. I think, I think the thinking that's gone into reflection on gender provides a useful framing that I certainly relied on in thinking about the other identities. And I also tried to say things, for example, in the religion chapter that connected with questions about gender and religion. So I wanted there to be questions about gender. It's true. I didn't have a chapter that's called um, C for gender. I don't know what the C word for gender <laughs> that, would be. That was, that, was why, that was why you left it out, right? It starts with G. Um, but, but no, I, I think that, that some of the most useful thinking about identity has come through feminist and post-feminist thinking about gender. And, and in the first chapter, which is called C for classification, mm -hmm. I try to, uh, to so show how mostly with examples from gender and sexual orientation, um, you, you can sort of think of identity, uh, a, a theoretical structure for thinking about identity. So um, it's an interesting fact that I, that the, these, these, this book derives from lectures I gave, and in the lectures I said less about gender. Um, that was partly because um, I was only allowed four lectures, and a lot more has been said about gender that's interesting than has been said, I think, about some of these others. Also, I agree with a lot more of what's been said about gender than I agree with a lot of what's been said about the others. But since this was a book, I was allowed to go on about things beyond what I talked about in the lectures. And it did seem inevitable that I should say something about gender mm -hmm. and sexual orientation, because as you say, if one's thinking about um, identity, if one uses the word uh, social identity, the expression social identity today, those are going to be pretty early on in the list of things people start thinking about. Mm -hmm. um, and just one more point about your identity before we move on. Y you are descended from both British nobility and Ghanaian royalty, is that right? Um, connected to. My descent in Ghana is from uh, my, my father's uh, family were not the royal family of Asante where I grew up. But it is true that my aunt and my great aunt both married kings of Asante. And so I'm the nephew and great nephew of monarchs. And in that sense, I'm connected. And, and more importantly than that, I was very close to my uncle and uh, more before he was king because he was more accessible. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, to, and, my, and we visited my great uncle, you know, very often, many Sundays after church, we'd go and see him. Mm -hmm. So I knew them both very well. And so I hang out at a court. Um, and, and that, Certainly, that has shaped my thinking about the, the very powerful ways, I think, in which class affects people's lives. Um, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm not a monarchist 
even though I'm related to some monarchs, I think that uh, monarchy is very bad for equality, and I think equality is enormously important. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother's family were, I would say, I mean, they were members of, I suppose, a ruling class in the sense that her father was a British cabinet minister and Chancellor of the Exchequer, leader of the House of Commons and so on, and, her, and his father was the first, actually, Labour leader of the House of Lords, the first... Um, first leader of the Labour Party in the House of Lords along with somebody else. So, so I come from people who are used to rule. That's, that is absolutely true. Mm -hmm. And I'm very much aware that that's inflected my, um, my experience of other forms of uh, identity. In particular, I think um, my, my, my class position uh, uh, protected me from exposure to the forms of racism that are pretty hmm. prevalent in Britain uh, in particular, where I spent much of my childhood, uh, because um, I, yes, I wasn't wasn't white, but I was, you know, I was Lady Cripps's grandson and Lady Ricketts's nephew, mm -hmm. and, uh, and so on, uh, in the village uh, and, and in and in the in the places where I, you know, that helps. Sir John, Sir John's nephew in the other village. So there you are. That's that's interesting that that uh, class in some sense trumped or or or, or at least. Uh, Trump's race, or at least mitigated uh, the effects of it, because there's some tension between those two categories in American politics. Uh, some people on kind of the far left who are fed up with, uh, with what is called identity politics are saying that, that class should be uh, the, the, the key dimension, and in, in, in this very different sense, Trump's race. Yes. Well, I, I think um, uh, in general, I'm against the thought that any identity is um, outside of a context uh, more important than any other. Um, racism is a problem in the United States, so we need to have a response to it. Um, I think that a strong, positive racial identity on the part of people who are not white uh, is one of the solutions uh, in the short run. In the long run, when we get rid of racism, races will obviously be less salient and maybe strong racial identities won't matter. Um, but there's, here's what, what I agree with these people on the far left about. Um, class is much more important than in, in, in is much more important in, in, as a source of problems in our society than uh, is reflected in, sh in what shows up in our discussions. I've, we do talk about class. I don't mean we don't talk about class at all. People say people don't talk about class in America. That's not true. But we don't talk about it enough, and in particular, I, I agree with the left that we don't have enough solutions that are directed to the terrible problems associated with, with classism, and more than classism, by which I mean a kind of stigmatization of uh, working class people, um, just barriers to economic uh, and social success for uh, regular folk. Um, we, we, we are terribly deficient mm -hmm. as a society uh, in respect of seriously addressing those problems. Mm -hmm. and, and I think there's an argument on the left that if we had focused more on uh, class, then Donald Trump wouldn't be president um, because you would have been addressing some of the issues uh, that he spoke to. But um, uh, anyway, do you, do you have a view on that? Or? I mean, I, 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 I'm not good at counterfactual analysis of historical <laughs> processes. Uh, I agree. Nobody else is. Nobody else has. Every, every, I, every, I'm, but I'm, uh, you know, I was once at the Council of Foreign Relations and I was asked the question and I said, I don't know. And the president of the Council of Foreign Relations says, oh, nobody says that here. <laughs> uh, and I mean, I, I wish more people in public life more often said, I don't know. But here's what I do think. We should indeed have been doing more to deal with the bad consequences for the American working classes of the changes brought about by globalization than we had. Whether that would have produced a different result is less important to me than the recognition that we should have done it. And that therefore, uh, since we didn't do it and we haven't done it, we should be doing something about it now. Mm -hmm. That seems to me the, the really important uh, thing to see. Okay. So before we, before we get into this book, do talk a little about cosmopolitanism, your, 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 your well-known book. Just what was, the, what was your main point there? I mean, the main, the main thought was that um, we are, uh, well, that, that it's good that I would urge people to think of themselves not just as citizens of a city, a state, and a country, but as citizens of the world, that that's compatible with being a good citizen of a city, a state, and a country, and that um, 
there's a tradition that calls itself cosmopolitan, and the expression cosmopolitan is just from the Greek expression for a citizen of the world, of course, cosmopolites. But, um, but there's a tradition of cosmopolitanism which is both uh, combines two things that I I find attractive. One is universalism, the, the recognition that everybody on the planet matters, that it isn't just the local people that matter, it isn't just your fellow citizens of your country, or or for that matter, your state or your city. Um, but the other thing is that. Um, cosmopolitans are interested in, engaged with, excited by contact across boundaries, not just national boundaries. Um, also, I think boundaries of, of race and religion and so on. But um, and, and that that's an exciting, an attractive uh, perspective to have on the world. Um, I think the obligation to recognize that everybody matters isn't a particularly cosmopolitan one because it's just morality. It's immoral to think that anybody on the planet doesn't matter. It may be that people lo locally matter more for me than other people, but the, the idea that anybody, any human being, doesn't matter strikes me as morally ridiculous. Um, but I don't think it's compulsory to, to be excited by uh, uh, interaction across societies. Mm -hmm. I, I think we need people who are because the world is a very interconnected world, and without those people, those interconnections are mostly going to cause trouble. But I think people who want to live quietly, cultivate their gardens with their neighbors and not take much interest in other kinds of people. I think that's certainly morally permissible as long as you aren't doing harm to those other people. Uh, I'm just urging that some people at least, the people that I was addressing in that book, should take seriously the thought that these forms of cosmopolitan interaction are an exciting part of living a, a rewarding human life. So, so Anthony Bourdain would have been a thoroughgoing cosmopolitan. I mean, yes. I mean, though so you can travel a lot. There are lots of people who travel a lot who aren't cosmopolitan, right? So there are lots of accountants who are sent to Rio from New York or sent to Hong Kong from London. And what they do when they get there is hide out in a hotel that looks as possible like New York or London, eat food that's as much as possible like the food they eat at home, take no notice of the fact that Rio is having a really exciting festival around them or that Hong Kong is, is uh, full of excitement because uh, the people of Hong Kong don't like the government in Beijing, and, um, and then they go home. Uh, so travel doesn't guarantee that you'll, be, <laughs> that you'll be cosmopolitan. It's a matter of your attitude. And conversely, people who have great difficulty in traveling, people in many refugee camps in the world, can nevertheless be cosmopolitan. It's just that they're not able to exercise it in that way because because they don't they don't have the documents and the permissions to move around. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as you kind of suggested, there is a perceived tension between cosmopolitanism and some forms of uh, identity. I mean, in, and again, to get back to current politics, there is the view that ethno nationalism is partly a reaction against the perception that. Uh, elites, in this case, let's say America's elites, are too cosmopolitan or th that they feel a stronger uh, affinity with European elites than they do with with uh, Americans in the heartland, right? So, I mean, it's not an easy, I, I think, you know, you're, you're going to argue that there's certainly a compatibility between cosmopolitanism and national allegiance, but but it's not an easy tension to negotiate, or at least that's the perception. Well, I, I mean, I think the answer is, as with all stories about identity, that there are good and bad ways of doing it, and there are good and bad ways of being uh, what I once called a cosmopolitan patriot. Um, I, I think uh, there's nothing wrong with f someone like me, for example, finding my closest intellectual um, connections, the, my greatest engagement, with other philosophers all around the world, um, and the vast majority of whom are not fellow citizens of mine. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But I do have obligations here in the United States as a citizen, which mean that I can't be indifferent to or hostile to or um, contemptuous of um, significant parts of the citizenry of my own country. And to the extent that, as it were, Going to the opera in Vienna makes you despise um, people in the Appalachian Mountains who wouldn't care much for the opera in Vienna. That's bad. Um, it, uh, it doesn't mean 
that they, I don't think the people of Appalachia should be interested in opera in Vienna. I think some of them would enjoy it already, some wouldn't, and it's fine that way. I don't think we should look down upon them because they don't. We who do want to go to the opera in Vienna. So I think we've got to be, you know, we have, um, we have responsibilities to our fellow citizens of a sort that we don't have to everybody else. We have special responsibilities. Each, the citizens of France have special responsibilities to the citizens of France, and the citizens of the United States have special responsibilities to the citizens of the United States. And we should take those responsibilities seriously. And among those responsibilities, I think, is having a kind of respectful conception of our fellow citizens, not looking, and thinking of them as us. Mm -hmm. um, we need to think of them as us because we are charged with governing the Republic together. And we will screw each other's lives up mightily if we think of each other mostly as them, which is unfortunately one of the things that's going on at the moment. Um, you can't run a successful society in which there isn't some sense of us about, about the citizenry. Um, you can have some people who are outside that, but you can't have the, the, the society, as it were, closely divided between two thems. Um, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, it won't work. It's also wrong. <laughs> you shouldn't think of people in those ways. Um, even, even citizens, fellow citizens, I mean, look, look, all of us have attitudes we have in significant measure because of the, our upbringings and where we, you know, where we came from and so on. We, we, we aren't all, nobody is fully self-made. So that the, the the features of those of my fellow citizens from whom I'm most distant are mostly not individual features. They're not things that they chose. They didn't choose to be different from me. They're just different from me because their circumstances are different and traditions and the context in which they live are different from mine. And as a result, of course, we need to work. They need to work. I need to work to make sure that we can do this difficult job of running a complicated society together in a way that's respectful and that that assures each of us uh, that we get a reasonable deal from our society. All of that is serious stuff, and too much. And, and, and if an engagement with elsewhere gets in the way of doing that serious stuff, it's doing harm. But I don't believe. I mean, I've just said all those things. I believe them. I try to live by them. But I'm perfectly. But I do go to the opera when I go to Vienna. And I like the opera in Vienna. I'm not ashamed of liking the opera in, in Vienna, but I don't think anybody should be ashamed of not liking the opera in Vienna either. I'm, I'm very relieved to hear that, having never been to an opera. <laughs> uh. Well, and, you know, if I hadn't been taken to the opera at a certain point in my life, I wouldn't go to the opera now either. Right. And, uh, and so on. And that's, and, 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 you know, there are kinds of opera that I can't bear because I don't understand the music. I don't know. I've listened some to Chinese opera. It sounds like weird noise to me. Right? I wasn't raised properly to listen to it. I don't think it's... I, the fact that I can't appreciate it doesn't mean there's nothing to appreciate. It just means I'm not properly prepped. Okay. And on the other side of the coin, so 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 cosmopolitanism can, um, you know, there are... Uh, you can in some sense carry it too far or, 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 or kind of do it do it wrong or something. I mean, and so too with with national identity, I assume. I mean, sometimes people ask this question by saying, well, what's the difference between nationalism and patriotism? The implication being that nationalism is kind of the bad version. Do you, do you have yeah. an answer to that question? Well, I mean, I don't like using the words nationalism and patriotism to contrast something good and something uh, bad because I grew up in the household of a Ghanaian nationalist. We struggled for independence. Uh, he did write an autobiography, my father called the autobiography of an African patriot. But the movement he was in was called nationalism, and his patriotism mm -hmm. and his nationalism were pretty much the same thing. But look, yes, of course, um, one of the things that nationalism can do is to make people indifferent to the welfare of people who are not your fellow nationals. But patriotism can do that too. Um, I mean... There are different ways of thinking about what patriotism is. My own favorite way, because I wrote a book called The Honor Code, is to think of patriotism as a concern for the honor of your country, that it's patriots are people who, who want their country to be a good country, who want it to be respected in the eyes of its own people and respected in the eyes of the world, to be worthy of respect. Um, 
sometimes people talk about love, but of course, if you love something, you do want it to be worthy of respect too. So maybe love and respect are bound up together. Um, I think that's a fine attitude to have. My father had that attitude to Ghana. I have that attitude to the United States. Um, but though it's a fine attitude, it can come with an indifference to the legitimate interests of non fellow citizens, and that's bad. I mean, we, we do have obligations, moral obligations. These are not voluntary, you know, kind of uh, things you can sign up for if you like. We have moral obligations not to screw up the world for everybody, for example. And those obligations mean that it's not enough just to make sure we don't screw up the United States. If we contribute mightily to screwing up the rest of the world, that's wrong. And that's because other, everybody matters. Now, I completely accept the point that there are what, what philosophers would call legitimate forms of partiality, that it's okay to be partial to your own. And in particular, I think you ought to be partial to your own fellow citizens, just as you ought to be partial to your children. It would be absurd to suppose that there was something wrong in having a special concern and interest in your own children, even though, of course, you shouldn't behave in a way that's damaging to anybody else's. Right. And I think we should think about citizenship in a similar way. So, of course, Americans matter more to me, especially in political terms, than anybody else, except a few relatives of mine who aren't Americans. Mm -hmm. But um, then that's because family matters too. Family partiality is also legitimate, as I just suggested, in relation to children. But, um, but I don't think that that's a, a necessary problem of patriotism. Lots of patriotism can, can kind of involve loving and celebrating and caring about the fate of your country while recognizing that everybody else is entitled to feel that way about their country too. And indeed wanting to help them mm -hmm. be able to achieve that, which means in the case of American foreign policy, helping them to get rid of dictators so that they can have democratic participation in their countries of a sort that we'd like to have here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> And I mean, as, as long as we're using the word love in respect to countries and analogizing the relationship to that with loved ones, um, it, you can also love your children, say, and yet not be proud of everything they do and sometimes even maybe be ashamed of them and, and, and want deeply to correct their behavior. Um, you, can, you can be ashamed of them because you love them. You wouldn't be ashamed of them if you didn't love them. And so my shame at what America is doing under Trump connects with my love of America. I wouldn't care. I mean, it, it's, it's bad for the world, a lot of it. And so I have an objective reason for disliking it, mm. but I have a deep subjective reason for, <laughs> for disliking it because it's, it's, it's putting my country in a bad light. Right. And it's, if I didn't care about my country, I couldn't feel like that. Okay. So as for this book, the lies that bind, um, Again, you go through these these five kind of dimensions of of identity, religion, country, race, class, and culture. Uh, and before you do that, you, you 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 make a few observations about kind of properties they all have. One of them involves the word essentialism, and I think that's really uh, pretty central to your analysis. Uh, you want to uh, most people have heard the word, uh, but do you want to make sure that they understand what you, what you mean by that? Good, yes. I mean, especially as a philosopher, because there's a philosophical use of the word essentialism, which I'm not using. This is the psychologist sense of essentialism. This is the idea which is natural to us and occurs very spontaneously in small children. You know, three, four, five-year-old children are prone to think this way, that if people belong to a group, share an identity, they must have some deep internal shared property in common. There must be something behind the surface um, uh, similarities, but also behind the surface differences that binds them together. And um, there are two things wrong with that. In general, it's not true. But the other thing is, even if it is true in some cases, usually people get the essence wrong. That is, they think that the thing that binds the people together is, in fact, not the thing that binds the people together. It's something else that does bind them together. And so over and over again, in relation to all of these identities, and, and this applies also to the to gender and sexual orientation, people are inclined to think that um, a person is kind of, if they belong to the group, they've got this thing inside them that's expressing itself in their group membership, but then is associated deeply with all sorts of other things. And that's, um, in general, 
not the case. There's enormous behavioral, psychological, uh, physical diversity within all the major identity groups. And there's also moral diversity and diversity of interests and so on. And so, in general, um, identifying someone, marking them as having certain identity, tells you less than we're inclined to suppose, I think. Okay. Uh, it's hard to find the essence of these things. I mean, I mean, you certainly, uh, you start off with religion, I think, right? That's the first one. And you certainly make the case there uh, that, you know, I mean, uh, religions assume all kinds of forms. Uh, you know, it, it, it's not that easy to to specify a single thing that characterizes all Christians, for example, Ex, you know, except the basics, and you might even find exceptions there. They think Jesus, they believe Jesus was the Son of God, Jesus was divine. There's a few things, but when you get to their actual values, which is where the rubber meets the road in a certain sense, I don't think there's, if you look at the way their values are expressed in their behavior, and I would say the same about any religion, I don't think there's a single thing, right, <laughs> that characterizes right. anywhere near all of them. No, and in fact, especially when you're talking about these big global religions, the the internal diversity of them is absolutely astonishing. Um, there are literally tens of thousands of Protestant sects now. <laughs> and, and all of them have some, or most of them have some weird thing that, that makes them have, accounts for the fact that they broke off from somebody else or started all over again. In the 19th century, when the Mormons came along, lots of people said they weren't Christians because they believe that God has a, a, a perfect and eternal body. They thought that, and that's not been part of the tradition of mainstream uh, European Christian thinking, and, and so on. Um, now, standing on the outside of this, I don't claim any authority to declare who's who is and isn't Christian. Uh, I'm only going to say that if it wouldn't be very helpful to use the word Christian in a way that insisted on some very specific set of, say, beliefs, because that would mean that the vast majority of the people in the history of the world who call themselves Christian would turn out not to be Christians. And what would be the point of that? What would be the point of having a kind of tight, logical definition if it excluded most of the people for whom it mattered? Um, and Christians have tended historically to be preoccupied with formulations of creeds, their Christianity uh, is, uh, is uh, the, the early history of Christianity is the history of uh, c conferences of bishops fighting about <laughs> creeds. Uh, and so that, I think, gives people in, in the Christian and post-Christian world a tendency to think that, well, everybody else must be like that too. But, but that's not so. And in fact, lots of Christians aren't like that. And furthermore, most Christians don't even understand the official creeds that go with their sects, including Catholicism, let alone believe them. I take it to be a condition of believing a creed that you'd have to understand it. But if you go, th if you go through with them with people, you say, being of one substance with the Father, what does that mean? Uh, he descended into hell. Does that mean that hell is literally down from here? Does it mean that if we just drill far enough, we'll find hell? And so on. Um, so I think uh, it's just... Um, and it's not worth it. It's not worth trying to find the definition. What we can say is that this label is used by certain people, that it signals in a particular context, it can signal something quite specific. Um, just as sectarian differences, if you're in Northern Ireland, Catholic or Protestant, well, that signals, you know, whether I'm going to shoot you in certain contexts, right? Um, and and the, the, that's not, it doesn't matter what the theology is in that context. Yeah. So uh, now essentialism is most often used in the context of warning people about their conception of some other group, right? Like, so trying to emphasize that uh, there is no essence of Islam, there may be some Muslims who did some bad things, but you, you can't attribute that kind of motivation or their governing, their motivating beliefs um, to, to Muslims broadly. But, but, but your kind of one point you're making is that essentialism matters, not just in the, it's in the characterization of other groups. It's, it's, 
it's very often deeply involved in your characterization of your own identity yes. and, and might be a source once, once properly understood might, might become a source of skepticism about the way you've been thinking of your own identity. I think that's right. So again, um, um, I mean, I, I, I try to be respectful about other people's religious traditions, even though I disagree a lot about with the metaphysics and often with the ethics that go with them. Uh, so I'm not trying to be disrespectful when I say that when um, evangelical Christians say that they believe in the literal truth of the Bible, I find it hard to believe them because I've read the Bible and I know they have read it too. And it seems to me that it's inconsistent and you can't believe contradictions. You can't believe as a, as a logician would say, you can't believe P and not P. Um, and it's also much of it, not the sort of thing that even invites belief because a lot of it is poetry. A lot of it is stories. Um, Christ doesn't intend us to think that there really was a good Samaritan. He's just telling a story to make a point, a very good point in that case. So, um, so I think uh, you can't, uh, but if you ask conservative evangelicals in particular in this country, you know, what defines them? They're likely to mention something like that. Well, we're the ones who believe in the, in the literal truth of the, of the Bible. And so they've got an account of their own identity that I think is wrong. Um, it matters to them to say they believe in the literal truth of the Bible. I understand that. That, that performance matters to them. And that performance is something they use to signal to one another who they are. But I think that they misunderstand, I think they misunderstand themselves. Just as I'm sure I misunderstand all sorts of features in my own life. I'm not saying this is something that, uh, that only other people do. Uh, but, but in that case, I think there is a misunderstanding. So, and, and similarly, I think that, that many Christians, uh, because of this tradition of focusing on expressions of belief, understate the importance to them of the community life in defining who they are. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's most interesting about practicing Mormons, I think, is the way in which family life and church life are so deeply connected together in a way that used to be more common with other Protestant and, for that matter, with, with Catholics. And, um, but I think they may not, of course, they value that. And if you asked them, they'd say, yes, of course, we value that. But if I said to them, I think that's a really important part of who you guys are, <laughs> they might say, no, no, the, the key thing is, is um, you know, is, is the official doctrines of the church. So I think, um, yes, people make these mistakes about themselves. Mm -hmm. Look, uh, I'm going to get into trouble for saying this, but, Go ahead. Um, but, but, but I think that when, when a trans person says, a trans, uh, 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 let's say an, an M2F trans person says, I was really a woman all along, um, that seems to me too simple a story about what's going on and maybe not even the correct story. I, I'm happy, of course, to, to, I am happy, not, I don't say of course because some people aren't happy, but I am happy to have someone in those circumstances, um, declare a gender identity and ask to be uh, recognized in that gender identity. I don't have any problem with that, but I don't think it follows from that that I have to agree with them with their account of what's going on. And what they're doing is employing a kind of essentialism. In other words, the essence of a, a, a being a woman is how you feel uh, about yourself as opposed to certain biological things. Right, right. Yes. And, and again, I don't think it's helpful to try and say what really makes someone a woman um, or a man or indeed makes it the case that they're neither. Mm -hmm. um, the, <laughs> the boundaries are going to be fuzzy. Human biology is, again, much more um, uh, messy and mysterious than I think most people realize. And so there just isn't a good answer. There isn't a good sort of deterministic biological answer. Um, it's not in the chromosomes either because plenty of people are neither XX nor XY, but the XOs are all socially speaking, not all, but mostly socially speaking women and so on. So I think it's, it's going to be, turn out to be... And this, why, why would we want mm -hmm. uh, an essence? Mm -hmm. 
uh, we can do with the kind of messy flexibility that identities, in fact, have. Indeed, the, the, when you make them too sharp and precise, they actually get less useful. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and just one one more point about essentialism in in the context of religion, or or in many other contexts, it is sometimes used when it's used self-referentially. It's sometimes used as a differentiator with groups that are using the same label to suggest that they're not the real thing, right? Exactly. Yes. So, and, and some of the worst treatment in the world today is meted out to people because they're thought of as bad exes rather than just another kind of ex. Mm -hmm. So Ahmadiyya Muslims in, in Pakistan are not allowed by law to call themselves Muslims. But in many yeah, you know, I grew up in a place where there were other <laughs> Muslims. They're one of my sort of paradigms of what a Muslim is. I, I realize that, um, and again, I'm not. It's not. It's not up to me to decide who's who's a Muslim. But um, in that context, the insistence that they're bad Muslims, of course, leads to their being treated very badly. I would rather be a Christian in Pakistan than a, than an Ahmadiyya Muslim. And the the bad treatment that the Baha'i get in, in Iran is in part because though they think of themselves as having created a new religion, or they, they think of Baha'i Allah as having created a new religion, drawing on many traditions, uh, the official position of the Shia is that they're bad, they're, they're, they're apostate Muslims. So, yes, uh, in other words, they're, they're, not, they're not conforming to the essence, mm -hmm. the proper essence. And as you, as we know, the history of the um, the, the Holy Inquisition uh, in the Catholic case uh, was a history of treating with extreme uh, unpleasantness, uh, sometimes subjecting them to torture and death uh, by incineration um, of people who got things wrong, who who were not good Catholics because they didn't go along with something that the Church had decided was definitive of of uh, proper Catholicism. So I think um, in the names of a kind of is, in, in insistence that this is the proper essence of our identity, people treat other people very badly. And, um, and I'm, you know, uh, that's one of the things that I would like to discourage. Okay. <laughs> the, uh, so the second category, I mean, taken in the order in which they're presented in the book, is uh, country or, or, or na na nationality. Um, we've already talked about that a fair amount, but but it's as good an excuse as any to talk about uh, uh, an argument you make, which is that with, I think, all five of these uh, categories, um, the 19th century was an important era in, um, in giving rise to current, some current conceptions of, of, of them, some of which, uh, some of which you would like to take issue with. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, um, the first philosopher who said that the point of nations was to capture and run states, I think was Hegel, but the idea that, uh, that a, a nation was defined but he, he had an idea of the nation as defined by a shared spirit. And that idea is a bit older. It's, it's, a, it's a romantic idea. In the German case, its lead exponent was Herder, I think. And he thought that every, uh, every nation, every people, was defined by a shared spirit, which manifested itself in its, um, in its culture, music, folk dance, folk tales, but also poetry and, and high, high literature and, and novels and so on. So, so Goethe, but also Grimm's fairy tales are part of the defining essence, as it were, or reflections of the defining essence of the German people, uh, which he sometimes, well, actually, I don't think he used this word. I think it was first used later, but he had this idea, uh, which is articulated in the German word Sprachgeist, spirit of the language. Now, that's an essentialism. It says the nation is defined by this Geist, the Geist expresses itself in all these different things. Um, now, what's weird about this, and, and then, sorry, then in the 19th century, that thought is turned into a political program. And throughout, first in Europe, but then in lots of other places in the 19th and 20th centuries, um, uh, nations get organized around the thought that we are already united in our essence, in our spirit, 
And so we need to get along and take over and have a state that re represents that national spirit. What's odd about the invention of this by people like Howder and, uh, and, and Humboldt and so on in the late 19th, in the late 18th century is that at that point, the world didn't look like that at all. Europe was empires. Russian Empire, Ottoman Empire, which was still in Hungary and, and Bulgaria and so on. Um, the, um, the, the Roman, the Holy Roman Empire was, uh, and the residue of that in, in the German states and so on. Were, those were the things that were politically real. And, um, and so it's, it's odd to have thought that, um, you know, what really makes it suitable for people to be governed together is that they have this shared essence because even actually until the late 19th century, for example, something like a third of the population of metropolitan France didn't speak French. Mm -hmm. And in England, well, lots of them spoke English, um, and though some of them still spoke some other uh, Celtic languages, like and Cornwall and places like that, um, they couldn't understand each other because the forms of English they spoke were extremely different. And in the British Isles, of course, there were also forms of Gaelic. Um, so... It's just weird that anybody ever thought that this was a good story because it so runs against what's actually going on in most places when this story is invented. Nevertheless, uh, through the 19th century, uh, the Germans come together in the middle of the late 19th century as a nation, though huge numbers of German-speaking people were not within the German nation at that point. Italy comes together at the same point which had been a hodgepodge of different kinds of things, including the Papal States, comes together um, around a language called Italian, which again, <laughs> the Italians themselves call it um, lingua Toscana in bocca romana, the, the, the language of Tuscany in a Roman accent, which is to indicate it was invented for the purpose of being the language of Italy. Mm -hmm. What people actually spoke all over Italy was a whole bunch of languages, and Italian, some of them, but not all of them. In northern, northern Italy, lots of people spoke German, and other people spoke Ladin and various other languages, Friulian. So, um, so nevertheless, this idea took over, and now we think, well, it's obvious a nation is a group of people who share a culture, language, literature, traditions, and so on. And it isn't true today either, but it's more true than it was because this powerful idea took over. Mm -hmm. So by the end of the 19th century, everybody in France has been forced to speak French, or almost everybody. In England, a national dialect has been created through the education system, through the national education system, and people are writing, at least, in a standard form of English. German is unified uh, as a... Uh, in fact, the, the Brothers Grimm, who put together the Grimm's fairy tales were the same brothers Grimm who put together the first Deutsche Wörterbuch, the first German dictionary. Again, they were organizing the language for these nationalist purposes and organizing the folklore for these nationalist right, purposes. Right, right. So I think, um, but look, so, so it's a bad idea because it, because it wasn't true. And the, the important point is it isn't true that you need to have those things in common in order to govern a state together. Mm -hmm. Most states historically, including some of the most successful, have been multicultural. Our society is multi-identitarian, but so was, so is, so is England, so is France, despite what they say about themselves. So was the Holy Roman Empire, so was the Ottoman Empire, and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's funny. I mean, people sometimes think of national identity as a, almost a platonic form, you know, I mean, like, if you're like me and inclined to talk about the need for, like, global governance, maybe some sacrifice of national sovereignty to, you know, international agreements that wind up helping the country and things like that, um, they, some people talk as if, you know, that, I'm, you know, national identity, it's this immutable, and, and as you, as you note, it wasn't always with us. It really took some doing to make it a thing to the extent that it is a thing. Yes. Um, and, and in, the, in that sense, identity, the, the, I guess you might say geographic dimension of identity is a manifestly malleable thing. Yes. And, and, uh, a good thing too. I mean, what would it be like if we all had to, uh, <laughs> you know, share the same folk tales, folk songs, language, uh, uh, read all the, all read the same novels, all listen to the same music in order to be able to live together in the same state. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd rush screaming for the exit 
uh, of a state like that. Um, so, and so would most people. So I think that, um, uh, and unless, of course, it was their particular constellation of interest that happened to be imposed upon everybody else, I suppose they might stick around if that were to happen. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a bad idea. Of course, you know, that doesn't mean that you that any old hodgepodge of people w can be made to run a state successfully together with nothing in common. You do have to have uh, shared understandings in order to be the, the co the co managers of a, of a state, you, the, the citizens of a republic. But it turns out that um, sharing in poetry or novels or folk tales isn't too important in that sort of thing. What's really important, and here the United States, I think, has historically at least had a very strong tradition of the right answer, which is civic nationalism, where what we sh what we commit to sharing is, yes, we have a political language because we need to talk to one another about what to do, but we don't have a political language because it's the expression of a national essence. We have a political language because it's convenient for it to be English because most of us already speak English. And when people join, we invite them to speak English too because they'll get, they, they'll do better if they can understand the conversation of the society. Um, but we don't require them to stop speaking anything else. If they want to go on speaking Spanish or Chinese or, or German, fine. What, you know, what's wrong with that? But we do want them to learn English and we want their kids to learn English because we want them to be able to participate in the, in the life of the society. Now, um, uh, that participation requires more than just being able to participate to, to uh, share the language. It requires some commitment to what the current constitutional and political conventions are, some understanding of how politics is done and made in, in your society, some willingness to accept that there will be things in the political organization of your society, laws that you don't like, and that there are means for trying to do something about that which don't include just ignoring them. And so on. I mean, there, you do need to have a political uh, consensus, but it, but that's that's actually not super thick, and it's compatible with. So I'm committed to all those things in this country, but I, as I said, I I, I like going to the opera in Vienna, <laughs> and I like going to to um, to festivals in Ghana, uh, and I like going to, to the theatre in London, and I like reading novels from Japan. And all of those things are perfectly consistent. And, you know, you can be a very good American citizen and not care about American literature. Mm -hmm. That's fine. I mean, I think if you don't care about American literature, you're really missing out on something. So I would urge you to re rethink. But uh, I'm not going to urge you to rethink in order that you should participate in the national culture so that we can be fellow citizens together. That's it's a mistake. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting mistake. It was a powerful mistake. It reshaped the world. It led to a lot of good things. It led to the creation of states in which people could speak to one another because they shared a language and there was a national education system. But it also led to ethnic cleansing, genocide, and murder. Mm -hmm. and, 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 um, and frankly, I don't think it was worth it if that's, if that's what it was going to pay. High price to pay. High price to pay. Um, um, and, and that long history of, of ethnic cleansing and reshaping, of course, went on well into the 20th century. Uh, of course, the Nazis did a lot of it, but then in the post-war period, the the the, the allies, the, the the winners, the victors, did a lot of it. We pushed a lot of people around in Europe during that period after the war. With we agreed, we allowed we and the Russians collaborated to do that, mm -hmm. and uh, and a lot of horrible stuff went on. Okay, well, I guess that uh, leads to the subject. Uh, of race, at least obliquely. Now, when you say uh, that here too, the 19th century was an important period of time, um, you're not saying that race was not used as an identifier before then, uh, or that there was no kind of essentialism ever applied to the category or or no discrimination or anything else. So what what is it? In what sense was the 19th century important? I think the main thing that's important about what happens to the race concept in the 19th century is that the 19th century is the century in which biology becomes a science. The word biology, biologie, actually in German, was actually coined in 1800, believe it or not, hmm. in Germany. And so there's no word for, for what we call biology before that. And natural history is a different thing from biology. Uh, the, the study of plants and animals separately is a different thing from thinking of them all as one thing, the subject of a single science. 
And one of the things that happens, of course, in the 19th century is that human beings come to be a legitimate subject of this science, not separated from nature, not something to be studied uh, okay. separately from nature, but we are now, and that means that if race is important, I see. It's, it, it's got a biological story. And so throughout the 19th century, people are trying to find the biological story. Now, there are interesting, I don't, I don't in fact talk about this in the book, but there are interesting uh, intellectually heroic figures in the mid-19th century, some German philosophers, for example, who make the anti-essentialist point about race, but they're running against the tide. The tide is in the other direction. And the thing that happens is because of the rising prestige of the sciences in general and of the life sciences in particular, deference to the assumption that race is a biological thing occurs very, very widely outside the sciences. So Matthew Arnold, one of the great poets of the 19th century, arguably the greatest literary critic in English of the 19th century, talks about race all the time in trying to discuss the character of the verse of the Welsh. He, he gave some lectures on Celtic literature when he was professor of poetry at Oxford, uh, when he's talking about what he called Hebraism and Hellenism as the two spirits that came together in, in Britain uh, in his book on um, culture and uh, anarchy. So, um, uh, and historians, started saying, well, the history is, in fact, very often they said, literally, history is the history of races. And they told historical stories about, say, um, England, which required them to identify the races that went to make up England, the Angles and the Saxons and the Anglo-Saxons, the Danes and so on, and to tell the story as a story of the coming together of these various races with their essences. So. Arnold thinks that the, the kind of clunky character of German prose is an expression of the Germanic essence, the Germanic spirit, the Germanic race. He thinks that the, what he thinks of as the sentimentality of the uh, Welsh bards, and who he went to hear singing their poems at the uh, Eisteddfods in, in Wales, that their sentimentality was an expression of the sentimentality of the Celtic race. The Celts were sentimental. Uh, the Germans were systematic. Uh, the, the British, the, the Anglo, the Anglo-Saxons were uh, businesslike, and so on. Um, <laughs> uh, because their race, racial essence, entailed these things. So all these things get um, joined together in the race concept in a very, you know, in a way that I mean, I don't know. It strikes me as weird to do this, to assume this. But these were very smart people. In fact, in the late 19th century, almost all the smartest people thought mm -hmm. that the way to understand all these things was through race. So, that, and that meant that race as an idea got this authority from the increasing prestige of the sciences and the idea that the sciences are what really tell you the truth about reality in a way that meant that then you get something in the 20th century, which the Germans in particular took up, race science, where they went around, you know, measuring the bodies and assessing the characters of Jews and tried to suggest that there was some racial mm -hmm. essence that explained why Jews were, were taking, over, uh, taking over business, uh, which they weren't, by the way, but that's what they thought, and so on. And... Um, uh, and, and uh, you know why um, Africans were fit for uh, domination uh, by the German Empire. Yeah. Now this, uh, in a way, leads to your your chapter on culture. Uh, so maybe we can, for now, let's jump over the the intervening chapter on class. But um, in a couple of senses, first of all, Matthew Arnold plays a role in your your chapter on culture, but also culture. Um, whatever your skepticism about some of its deployment is sometimes deployed um, in opposition to this emphasis on race as determinative, right? In fact, it's thought yes. of as kind of the main alternative uh, explanation in some sense, or uh, yes. I mean, environment more broadly, you could say. But, but um, so, so it's an interesting concept. And it's, I, I, I should say, it's not, um, it's not one as commonly associated, I think, with identity, the way identity is currently used as some of your other categories. Um, 
and yet there is there is a kind of essentialism sometimes associated with it. and and I, I I guess come to think of it, it 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 looms large in the rhetoric of some of the ethno nationalists these days. It's it's uh, you know, and some of them would say they're they're not really saying uh, their culture is better, but they certainly think it's a very real thing that should be preserved intact. You know, the way the way people some people used to say during the days of segregation. Uh, I, mean, I don't think one race is better than the other. They should just remain separate. But 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 anyway, that's a that's a long winded way of um, of asking you to to uh, well, to, well to talk a little about culture. <laughs> <laughs> so you're perfectly right that uh, one important kind of discourse about culture was developed by anthropologists precisely as an alternative to the racial account of human difference the people like Boaz in the early 19th century, mm -hmm. drawing on the guy that I talk about, uh, uh, E.B. Tyler, who was the first professor of anthropology at Oxford, uh, but, 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 but Boaz, who was a German who came to the United States, um, is really a key figure in this, um, wanted to substitute cult for race precisely because he understood racial essentialism to be a mistake. He thought that it was just wrong to think that the correct account of why I don't know, the Zulu were different from the, their neighbors, was to do with the biological character of, uh, of, of Zulus as opposed to their neighbors, any more than he thought that the differences in culture between Africans and Europeans could be explained simply by appeal to some racial essence. He, he thought that was just, that wasn't going to work as a story and they needed an alternative story. And so culture was invented, I mean, the, this notion of culture was developed in order to do that thing. And, um, this in, this notion of culture, that notion of culture, um, depends on the prior notion of biology. Because if you ask, what are they saying is belongs to culture? The answer is everything that doesn't belong to biology, right? Mm -hmm. So um, Tyler defines culture as all the socially transmitted traits. In other words, the not biologically transmitted traits of human beings. Um, now. Um, in that sense, there must be culture. There must be socially transmitted traits of human beings, and I'm not saying that that's not true. What I am saying is that essentialism about cultures, the idea that because these people have shared um, socially transmitted something, it follows that they're then going, A, bound to continue to be uh, like that and like each other, or B, uh, um, that, that that's, as it were, explains everything about them. Those are those that that's just not right. And this shows up, I think, in the way in which appeals to Western culture, or the idea of the West as a, as a civilizational identity that defines, um, you know, the Europeans and, and, uh, and the white members of the alt right, as it were, um, is, uh, is, is, um, is, committed to, the, to a number of thoughts that I think are mistaken. One is that things like, and here we're with Arnold, so, so Tyler and Arnold, Tyler has this notion that all the socially transmitted things are to be called culture. By culture, Arnold means the best that has been thought and said. He means high culture, he means novels and, and, and great music and painting and so on. Um, now, of course, Tyler would have agreed that what I will call culture was part of culture, but he would have said a, a lot more of it is important. Some of the modern appeals to Western culture or Western civilization are claims that what Arnold meant by culture, the high culture, is somehow the natural possession of Westerners, whoever they are, right? Now, um, I want to reject that thought for a very simple reason. Um, you don't possess Shakespeare by being born somewhere or by being born a certain color or by being born descended from a certain people. You possess Shakespeare by the careful study of, by the careful study and appreciation of, of performances and of texts. Uh, if I believe in these civilizational inheritances, I happen not to be exclusively interested in ones that were produced in Western Europe in, in a certain period. I think that there are lots of wonderful ones from elsewhere as well, which I'm interested in. But, their value for us now depends upon our not precisely on our not thinking of them as 
promised to us, but as things we must struggle for, study, maintain. And, um, and A, and B, because that's how you get your relationship to them, anybody can enter into that relationship with them. There are many very fine Japanese scholars of James Joyce. They're much better scholars of James Joyce than a lot, awful lot of Irish scholars of James Joyce or American scholars of James Joyce. Um, but similarly, there are some fantastic uh, scholars of, of Buddhism who are not from Asia. And they get to be entitled to, to talk about and to possess Buddhist tradition because they've done the work. There's a kind of laziness built into this way of thinking about Western civilization, according to which, because I'm a Westerner, I just get to own Bach. I get to own um, uh, Shakespeare. I get to own Dostoevsky and a bunch of other people in the world who also have done nothing don't get to own it. Don't get to own it. That's, that's the wrong way to think about Arnoldian culture. It's the wrong way to think about the, the, the forms of high culture that matter. Now, I don't, you know, Arnold and I would disagree about the, which things have value. And I'm more eclectic in my sense of what has value. Uh, he didn't think that all the things that were valuable came from white people, though. He absolutely didn't think that. But he did have a kind of, I would say, elitist notion. Uh, uh, because whereas I think that great creativity can come from all kinds of social classes and contexts, and that, uh, and that that doesn't mean I don't think there's a difference between good stuff and bad stuff, but I don't think that this distinction between good stuff and bad stuff is the distinction between stuff produced by bourgeois people and stuff produced by non-bourgeois people. I think that's the wrong way to think about it. So you said, you know, nobody owns culture, which uh, kind of uh, suggests the subject of cultural appropriation, which is, <laughs> has become a, a thing where, where people are accused of, uh, uh, in some sense, taking something, of a piece of culture that in some sense belongs to another group. Now, typically, the allegation does not involve uh, the the ownership of the kind of culture that Arnold was talking about. It, 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 the, the allegation isn't you stole something from these upper class Brits who thought it up. The, the allegation is typically made uh, about stealing from groups that have been marginalized, uh, uh, say jazz, uh, you know, from African Americans or whatever. Um, and of course, there are. I think everybody agree there. There, there are issues of attribution. There, there, there are. Uh, you know, but 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 that said, uh, what what what's your take on cultural appropriation? Well, I mean. <sighs> I think that the the language of property provides the wrong mo uh, model here, and in particular, I think the idea that jazz belongs to, as it were, to black people collectively, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that, so that it's an it's an identitarian possession, is wrong in two ways. It's wrong because it's just false about jazz that it was made by exclusively by black people. Just false, not true. Some very important people in the history of jazz were not black. Uh, it's a black form in some sense, but that doesn't mean, we know it doesn't mean, that there can't be enormously important contributions to it made by people who aren't black. But the second thing is, most black people have had nothing to do with jazz. They didn't make it. Most, most contemporary jazz black people don't even listen to it. Uh, um, and so, um, in what sense is it theirs? Well, only in the sense that I was suggesting that's the wrong way to think about these sorts of things. Uh, and so, um, so my first response is, um, it's, it's the wrong model for thinking about these things. Now, like you, I can see that there are contexts in which uh, legitimate complaints can be made. Um, if you exploit someone from a marginalized group, take some ideas of theirs, make money from them, don't give them anything, that's bad. But that has nothing to do with group membership. That has to do with exploitation. That has to do with treating people in a way you ought not to treat people, whatever their identity. Um, I think also that some things matter to some groups, and treating them inappropriately is disrespectful. You shouldn't make jokes about the Kurdish. You, 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 you're not, I'm not Jewish, but I know that. I know that it's a, it's a serious prayer of mourning. And it's not, it's not the sort of thing that should be brought up as, as an object of, of humor, uh, and so on. Uh, but that's not about cultural appropriation either. It's not, the problem isn't appropriating the Kaddish. If I appropriate the Kaddish respectfully, if I say, this prayer seems to me like the ideal prayer to remember my ancestors, my, my ancestors, um, 
no, no Jewish person has a basis of complaint, right? I mean, they, they, if they believe in cultural appropriation, they would, mm -hmm. but, but they shouldn't. They should say, in fact, that's a very respectful way of taking something on board. And um, I, I would say it would be ungenerous of them to, came, to sort of claim some sort of hold on it. So I'm, I'm, I'm willing to acknowledge that when people talk about cultural appropriation, there's sometimes some bad thing in the background. But the bad thing in the background, in my view, is never that somebody of one group took a cultural thing from some other group. Because I don't think that that's how culture is owned. Um, uh, uh, Beethoven symphonies belong, if they belong to anyone, to Beethoven. They do not belong to the Germans. They do not belong to Europeans. They do not belong to white people. They don't belong to some smaller group uh, of people who come from whatever town I forget Beethoven was born in. Um, and, and the people, again, you know, Beethoven's a good example. Some of the best performances of Beethoven uh, symphonies in the world today are in Japan. Hmm. Anybody who cares about Beethoven will know that. Yeah. And, you know, it does seem to me that, uh, I mean, to discourage what's called cultural appropriation um, has a couple of bad consequences. Um, one is that it can stifle creativity. I, I mean, you know, uh, no. people, you know, there's a there's a video series online uh, done by a guy named Kirby Ferguson, uh, I think, who who has been on blogging. It's called Everything is a Remix. And okay. now he That's does he does start it out with an egregious case of illegitimate uh, appropriation, which is that I gather Led Zeppelin just out and out stole blues songs <laughs> from specific people, I think. Uh, it, it wasn't just that they were African American. They, it, you know, he didn't. You, you would say they didn't steal them from the race. They stole them from people. If they were specific yes. uh, songs attributed to people, but, um, but, but, but the point is also that all of the culture we cherish is a result of these mutations and this intermixing yes. of memes um, and so on. The other thing is, I, I sometimes think that um, to discourage appropriation is to risk uh, consigning important culture to the dustbin of history. I mean, I sometimes wonder if if mainstream culture would pay as much attention to the history of the blues had it not played such a large role in giving rise to rock and roll. Absolutely. I think that's true. Look, um, the point about creativity is really important, I think. Um, so I can think of lots of examples. Let me just take one. Um, haiku. Basho. Basho is the great 17th century master of haiku. The narrow road to elite north is a wonderful compendium of them combined with an account of a journey. Um, if Basho had thought that I have only to use what is Japanese, he couldn't have used the script he used because it was Chinese, and he couldn't have been a Zen Buddhist because Buddhism is Indian. So this paradigmatically Japanese verse form was produced in a cultural context which involved bother borrowing from the two major civilizations of Asia. Um, this is bad? Not by me. Um, Shakespeare takes the sonnet form from the Italian. Uh, it has to be changed because Italian and English have different forms of language and different forms of prosody, but he, he Petrarch, without Petrarch, no Shakespeare. Uh, or at least no Shakespeare sonnets, and he takes his narratives from all over, from from classical Roman narratives. Uh, his one of his most famous plays is about a Dane. I suppose he shouldn't have done that. He should have made it, uh, you know, Jonathan, Prince of Lancaster, or something, rather than Hamlet, Prince of Denmark. If you don't believe in borrowing from other places, if we think. Shakespeare, Basho, but I can do this for, yeah, I can do this for, for music, I can do it for, um, for German poetry. Uh, the best, Ursula Divan, one of uh, Goethe's great uh, poetic cycles is, is, an, is an homage to Hafiz, is a Persian poet of the 13th century, and so on. That's how the things that are at the Arnoldian end, the high end of stuff, that's how they actually get made. It would be horrible. To deprive ourselves of that form of creativity, mixture, hybridity is um, one of the great sources of uh, newness in the arts, mm -hmm. and I think it would be terrible to have the idea catch on 
uh, that you that only people of one sort can use things that are uh, symbolically associated with people of that sort. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, if you're worried about jazz, um, um, the instrumentation for jazz is almost entirely German. Mm -hmm. The the forte piano, and then the piano the piano forte, sorry, um, the saxophone. And so on. These are these are essentially uh, this is European instrumentation. Um, even the drums, though drumming itself is obviously a strongly African tradition. Indeed, it's a global tradition. Um, uh, the the actual form of the drums isn't isn't African in much of jazz either. Uh, again, what would be why why would jazz be improved by saying, "Whoops, we shouldn't have used those because they were uh, they, they were not ours." Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm. Yeah, I'm, I'm a hardliner on this one. I think it's the wrong way to think about these things, which is not to say that there isn't lots of injustice in the world, lots of stealing, lots of um, lots of stealing of things from people who own them, not from peoples, but from people. Uh, and nor is there lots of there's lots of disrespect in the world, which I'm against too, obviously, and so on. But talk of it in terms of cultural appropriation, I think, really puts us on a path to something very unattractive. Okay. Um, we kind of skipped your, your chapter on class, uh, which was the fourth of the, the five uh, the categories, I guess the, the sixth chapter maybe. But, but um, we, we talked about that a little earlier. I do have one question about class, though. Since you have, um, you're very familiar uh, firsthand with Britain, I mean, you, you, went, to, you went to kind of a school there, uh, both, both college and earlier. Um, and uh, and you've now lived in America a long time. Of course, there's this idea that America, at least relative to Britain, is a classless society. We make a lot less of class. Uh, at the same time, countries change. Both of these countries have changed. You hear more about income inequality in America now, and that's because there's more of it. Um, I'm wondering if uh, you perceived this distinction as being as sharp as it is said to be, as Americans often say with pride that it is, um, and also whether you think the, the distinction is being blurred or, or in any way the, the, the relative emphasis on class is shifting. I think in both societies, more than in either of the societies people are willing to acknowledge, there is an enormous set of barriers set in the face of what sociologists now sometimes call the precariat, the bottom, let's say, 15% of the income distribution. And part of the reason is they're not just in the bottom of the income distribution. They're in the bottom of social capital. They don't have social connections. And they're in the bottom of cultural capital. They don't have the kind of uh, educational experiences and, and successes that mark the, uh, the sort of the top people in our kind of society. And um, just two numbers. Um, uh, the, the Ivy League institutions, which we can think of as institutions for uh, continuing and, and creating privilege, um, uh, take more students from the top 1% of the income distribution than they do from the bottom 60%. Yeah. That sounds like a pretty class society to me. Mm -hmm. That's in the United States. Now, in the precariat in England, your chances of going to university are about 3%. That sounds like a class society to me. So these are both and those numbers are probably worse in some ways. In, in perhaps certainly, I, I think we we have done better in the past in this country. We we, we did badly in the mid-century, but in, in the sixties and seventies, I think we did better than we're doing now. So both of these are in that both of our societies are in that respect um, class societies. Um, I do think that, and I, I mean, I left England in my late twenties, so that's a long time ago. But when I lived in England, it was still the case that it was an enormously important fact about the home I lived in in England that the woman whose house it was had a title. My grandmother was Lady Cripps, and that my aunt Teresa, who lived next door, was Lady Ricketts, and that my uncle John, who lived 15 miles away, was Sir John Cripps. Um, that's less true, I think, than it was. I think mm. in, in that respect, and paradoxically, I think one of the reasons it's less true is Mrs. Thatcher, who was a conservative mm -hmm. politician, mm -hmm. because she was she was more egalitarian than some of her predecessors in the Conservative Party in some ways. So that's good, I think. Um, and 
On the other hand, I think when people say that people in the United States are, you know, don't think about class, turns out that if you ask them, people are perfectly willing to assign themselves mostly to classes in this country. And despite what people say, less than half of them are going to say they're middle class. Um, that is to say, it's not true that most Americans think they're middle class. It is the commonest self-designation. But um, there are a lot of people who, who identify as lower class and separately as working class. And there are people in this country, maybe 10% or something, who identify as upper class, whatever that means mm -hmm. in the United States. So I think people are actually quite class conscious in the United States. That is, they can answer questions about class, not, their, also not just their own, but other people's. And I think there's a kind of anxiety, particularly about the cultural dimensions of class, the cultural capital dimensions of class, which shows up in some of the resentment of East Coast elites by some of the people that we think about when we think about the white working class followers of President Trump. Um, they feel uneasy around people who talk the way I do, not because of my accent, mm -hmm. but because I seem to be educated in a way that they are aware they're not. And like it or not, and maybe they could be persuaded to come to see that this was a this was not right, like it or not, they think that it's better to be educated the way I am. That in some sense people who are educated the way I am are in some sense, not in many senses, not in every sense, but in some sense, better than they are. And so they care about being condescended to by the coastal elites, whereas they, their condescension towards us, which is just as a real phenomenon, doesn't worry us at all. I'm not, I mean, it worries me in a different way. It worries me because I don't, I, I think it's bad for either of us to be thinking about each other in these ways. But it, it doesn't, I don't feel um, degraded, as it were, mm -hmm. by their contempt. But apparently, they do. So we've got class stuff going on at a very sub sub substantial way, and it's mattering to our politics. It's mm -hmm. not just, it's not just a kind of side sideshow, and um, so we need to talk about it. I think we, we, we and, it, and, it, and it increasingly seems to overlap with another boundary, which is uh, or perceived boundary between the nationalists and the cosmopolitan. In other words, I I, I don't I would guess that a hundred years ago, the complaint uh, if there were complaints from lower class middle class people about the upper class, it wasn't that they weren't Americans. I would guess. I don't know. I wasn't there. Whereas now, that is sometimes a complaint. You don't really consider yourself American, uh, yes. American, right? No, and I think, so one form, one th way of thinking about what populism is, it's a claim on the part of a political group to represent the people, to be the real people, to be the real Americans mm -hmm. or the real Italians or mm -hmm. the real Germans. And um, that means that if, you disagree about a lot of political things with somebody and you're a populist, the only way of conceiving of them is as outsiders or as the instruments of outsiders. The, 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 the global cosmopolitan conspiracy against, against the, the common people of Italy, Germany, England. And that, that sentiment plays a role, played a role in Brexit, in, in the, in the decision of significant number again of of white working class people in England to uh, leave the European Union. Uh, and I think for the for a small number of Americans, it was important in their support for Donald Trump. I think we can exaggerate how much of his support came from there, and we shouldn't. Yeah. But some of it did, and enough of it did that if it hadn't been there, he might not have won. Mm -hmm. um, but that, 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 that isn't the... Uh, to focus on them is to forget that they're, they're a small proportion of the people who voted for him and that lots and lots of other people voted for him too who had other things that they were yeah. uh, thinking about. No, I think a number of people who voted for Trump were just fed up with the status quo or they just couldn't stand Hillary or both Clintons or yes. there, there were, I think. Or, 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 or they were just normal Republicans who vote Republican every time. Right. And they don't care about the distinctions among Republicans except maybe during the primaries. Right. But once, but once, once it comes around, I mean, and look, if I ask myself this question, what would it take to persuade me to vote for a Republican president, right? I find it hard to imagine myself doing that, right? Now, of course, part of the reason is I know what it's likely that the Republican candidate would believe, and I'm imagining that the Democratic candidate would be less likely to believe those things and more likely to believe things that I agree with. But 
I could imagine both parties shifting in ways that mean I would be kind of responding out of my old <laughs> sense of partisan loyalty and missing the fact that something important was going on. Um, look, that happened to some Republicans uh, as, as our parties sorted uh, in, in, the, in the in sort of Reagan era and afterwards and became more ideological and less large coalitions. There were... There were these people you, you, you may recall called liberal Republicans. They were uh, you know, yeah. Rockefeller Republicans. No. It took them a while, it took them a while to realize the shift that occurred. Um, I, I knew, in fact, um, there was, uh, I knew very well, indeed, an African American who had been, who, who was, who would have been over a hundred by now, but he, um, he had been a Republican because, because the Republicans were the party of Lincoln. And it took him a long time, well into the 80s, to realize that it wasn't the party of Lincoln anymore. I think there may have been a time when the only African-American in the Senate was Edward Brooke, but I'm not. That's correct. Uh, is that true? That's true. He's a Republican. And, yes. And, you know, and that was, um, he, he, was a, he, he was interesting in being African-American, but his views were, were not atypical of lots of people in the Republican Party at the time. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's all changed. Uh, but... You know, uh, and I think I know people, who, friends who are Republicans, who didn't vote for Trump, but who had a hard time because they're Republicans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it, he had to be really bad in a way that was rubbed in their faces before they would not vote for him. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, I don't know why I'm banging on about this, but I, I, when I'm talking to, especially when I'm talking to people outside the United States, I want to remind them that it's not as if the Republican Party is full of people who think everything that Donald Trump says is correct. There are lots of them who don't uh, on, on lots of things, on, on, on trade and, and so on. They're, they're quiet at the moment because he's very powerfully able to mobilize support, but they haven't changed their minds. Um, and they will try to bring the party back to what they will think of as reason, and I will think of as reason, frankly, too, uh, when he's gone. Yeah. Um, so by now, it may be apparent to some uh, listeners and viewers what you mean by the title, The Lies That Bind, but why don't you <laughs> spell it out to make sure? Well, I think all of these identities and many others that we, we can think about have the problem that they come with false pictures. That the pictures are false uh, doesn't mean that they can't bind us together, they can't be used for good. The problem with identity is never that it's identity, it's that it's being used badly, being used to bad effect. Um, and while I would like to correct some of the errors associated with some of these identities, some of the misunderstandings about how they work, I'm not supposing that that by itself solves the problem. The problem with them isn't that they're lies. The problem is that they're stories we use to bad effect when there is a problem. And the, the lies, of course, can sometimes be put to good effect. Uh, a simple story of the nation mm -hmm. uh, it, it can be helpful sometimes. So, um, so a, fa a nice, false sense of essentialism in a good cause isn't a horrible thing. Isn't a horrible thing. Uh, this, this continues a thought that was actually in my last book, which was called um, As If, Idealizations and Ideals, because its point was that much of our thinking is done with stories that are not just incorrect, but known by us to be incorrect, but that nevertheless provided we recognize that, they're the best we've got. Um, you, you can't abandon, say, uh, the NAACP on the grounds that most of its members have the wrong account of race. If the NAACP is doing good work, you may want to try and work to persuade them that the story is wrong. But in the meanwhile, it's a good idea to work with them on the projects that they're doing. And in those projects, their wrong story of race may be helping them to work together. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other any other thoughts about the book before we? Well, so one thing I would like to say is that um, I say at various points, but I mean it that 
my hope is to sort of contribute to the conversation. I'm sure I say some things in the book that will strike people as false, and maybe I'll come around to thinking some of them are false myself. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not. This is not offered as a kind of Bible of something. I, I'm trying to shift the conversation, but not to take it over. I want. I want. So I'm very much hoping that that people will take up some of these ideas, challenge them, uh, correct them, improve them. Uh, but I hope that. I will be helping to move some of the conversation in a useful direction. Mm -hmm. And if they just out and out take your ideas and uh, deploy them without attribution, you will not accuse them of cultural appropriation, or will you? I, I no, nope, I don't believe in intellectual property of that sort. Of course, as, an as an academic, you're sensitive to the <laughs> to the. <laughs> I'm sure it's afflicted you, right? It's very hard not to feel possessive about your ideas. It's hard not to, but as I said in the beginning of the, of the book, uh, that I'm talking in this book about temptations that I myself am subject to. Right. And so the fact that I'm the fact that I'm uh, t tempted that way doesn't mean that I think uh, reflectively that it's okay. Now I, I, I think, of course, it's natural to care about these things. So uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, on, uh, if you look up trolleyology, the word trolleyology on the web, mm -hmm. it describes its uh, creation to someone who uh, was reviewing a book of mine in which the word trolleyology occurs, mm. which suggests to me that I thought of it up. Mm -hmm. It's a, I'm telling you, I'm telling your, your, your listeners, do I, I don't care enough about it to do anything about it, except to tell a few people from time to time. Uh, and I think I shouldn't care about it because it's, after all, much more important that the idea is out there and useful mm -hmm. than uh, keeping track of who came up with it. And indeed, there is a law, whose name I can't remember, of social science, uh, that, that, uh, that says that, um, that great discoveries are almost always named after someone who is not, not the first the person to come, not the actual discoverer. Right, right. <laughs> By the way, I should thank you. I, I, I saw the subhead in the book, Scriptural Determinism, and I, yes. and I thought, hey, I used that in the Evolution of God, and I looked at the back. Yes. There was a, a footnote, uh, not only citing me, but quoting a full paragraph, roughly, of the book of my book. Yes, well, uh, a very helpful, a, very helpful book. Yeah. Thinking about religion, anti-essentialist, I must say, a very anti-essentialist book about religion, and therefore, and therefore, uh, excellent, much to be endorsed. Uh, well, okay, <laughs> well. Well, I've got what I came for, Anthony. Okay, right. so I guess I, you could have gotten there quicker. Then I guess we can, <laughs> I'd have been happy to I, endorse I, it. I, in no, the sky. I thought I needed to soften you up for ninety minutes or so to make sure. Um, but 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 really, great book. Thank uh, you. The lies that bind coming out even as we speak, and uh, and good luck with it. And I hope that um, you'll come back and talk to us uh, either either next time you have a book out or even sooner than that. That would be lovely. All right. Thanks.